All right, let's do it. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you today about unleashing your DevOps capabilities by using serverless. So I'm specifically going to be talking about how um, applying the principles of the three ways uh, with serverless leads to you operating with a, a much more focused DevOps mindset. Uh, so if we go right back to the start, where did DevOps came come from? Uh, so it's about 2009, the first DevOps days came about, and it was all about bringing developers and operations together. So typically, um, the, the bad ways are developers throw code over the wall and developers have to run it, uh, operators have to run it in production uh, and make sure that service stays up. And this was about breaking down that wall and getting to a point where um, they worked much closer together and, and you know, built better software because of it. Um, you can't really go to many talks about DevOps without getting a definition of DevOps. Uh, every definition is different. This is my definition. Uh, I like to think of it as the principles of flow, feedback, and learning. Uh, and it's really about the people, process, tools needed to achieve outcomes and deliver value for whichever business it is you are working in. Serverless as a term uh, was first being heard around 2012, so that's not actually that long after uh, the term DevOps came about, which might be quite surprising to a few because it's the hot thing at the moment, let's say. Um, but it wasn't until 2014 that it really blew up, and that was when AWS uh, released uh, Lambda, and that really opened up a whole new way of approaching how to develop software. Um, but Lambda itself is just part of a spectrum of what serverless actually is, uh, and it's really the functions as a service part of that. There's a whole lot of other components that are applicable to the serverless kind of ecosystem. And I think the best definition I've seen of serverless is this one by Paul Johnson, uh, which basically says a serverless solution is one that costs you nothing to run uh, when nobody is using it. So if, if there's nobody on your system, you're not paying for that system to be run at all. Um, that obviously excludes data storage. If data storage is there, you're going to be paying for that. Um, so if we ask the question, why serverless? Well, it scales. So it's scalable by default. Uh, it's resilient. It's built. Uh, it's got built-in high availability and fault tolerance across the cloud providers. Uh, it's more secure in the sense that you don't have to worry about patching servers under the hood uh, and managing those servers as well. And it's cheaper to run. So we've already said if you're not running anything, then you're not paying for anything at the same time as well. Uh, we've already been introduced to Simon Wardley today, uh, and he's got some views on serverless as well. Um, this blog post, Why the Fuss About Serverless, it's a, it's a long read, but if you want to deep dive into the Wardley mapping that Damon was talking about, this is a, a great post to read. Um, but he talks about how companies like AWS have commoditized that, that compute. And he goes as far as to conclude that now isn't the time for building DevOps teams that build infrastructure as a service for our, for our business. We should be getting on the wave of serverless. Um, and if, if we don't do it now, um, we'll find that ourselves being overtaken and being disrupted by other companies who do. Werner Vogels uh, also talks about reducing undifferentiated heavy lifting. And this came about more as a way to adopt cloud. But what we've seen with serverless is that this is becoming more and more the case. So I had a question. Our team has been building serverless uh, applications and architectures for just over a year now. And I've historically been a big fan of DevOps. So I asked the question, can we do serverless and DevOps at the same time? In my opinion, uh, serverless enhances DevOps. And I'm going to use the principles of flow, feedback, and learning to describe why I think that is. Uh, so the first way, the way of flow. Um, so the first way is all about moving from left, from generating an idea, uh, to right, to something running in production as quickly as possible. Traditionally, um, I've stolen this. So this is by a fellow called Yang Kui, who's quite big in the server space. If you're interested, check it out. Um, but Traditionally, we could look at a, a kind of process from idea to production that looks something like this. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this basically um, talks about you know, like what language are we going to use, what framework are we going to use, are we doing microservices, how are we deploying it, what does uh, the deployment pipeline look like for this, what does capacity planning look like. And we can see that there are quite a lot of steps that we have to get to before we've provisioned a service and we've got that actually running in production. With serverless, we take these 10 steps and we can go down to three which is we choose a language, uh, we master that language, we configure CI, CD, and then we can get into production. And we can use something like the serverless framework to deploy that into production. And we've, we've gone from um, all of these steps to thinking about things that we, we shouldn't really be thinking about in, in today's world, really. <laughs> so if I think about a developer, I'm going to be quite naive about this to start with. So 
let's define a developer as a person that writes code. So let's start to think about what a developer does now uh, as part of the first way. So the first thing is that a developer should write as little code as possible. Um, if we think about what differentiates our businesses, it's the code that we write. If we're writing code to uh, connect message queues, write to and from databases, then we're doing things that doesn't really differentiate our business. Uh, the second piece is that we should be embracing infrastructure as code. So everything, you know, as a developer, we want to get things into source control. It's the same with infrastructure. You know, we can do the same thing. We can define what those environments look like. So if I look at a developer in the, the context of the, the way of flow, the first way, I've changed it slightly so that it becomes a, it's a person that builds systems writing as little code as possible. If we do the same thing with uh, operations, um, so again, a little bit naively perhaps, but uh, an operations person is someone that manages and maintains your infrastructure. And what they kind of give us in, in that kind of first way in the way of flow is that they enable systems thinking. So they've got the skills to think about your system as a whole. Their, their job uh, before this was to understand how a system works so that we can keep it up and running uh, and make sure that, you know, the, the, the system is available so that the business is ultimately making money or whatever it is they're trying to do. They also bring reliability experience to the team. So a lot of the patterns that they learn for keeping applications up are still applicable in a serverless environment. And they can bring the, that to bear. Uh, they can bring that experience into the team. And finally, they can build deployment and management tooling. So this will already be a hell of a lot less than what we would have done previously building those services, even with Docker uh, and things like that. Um, and our definition of operations kind of changes to a person that is responsible for the health of the team service and systems as a whole and create deploy management tooling. And that's not to say that it's still operations people on call, um, but they bring a lot of experience in kind of that enabling systems thinking and how your applications are put together. Um, so secondly, the way of feedback. Uh, the way of feedback is all about creating and amplifying fast and continuous feedback. Um, and this comes in kind of two contexts. So you've got your systems metrics and your systems kind of things that are coming out, but it's also the business metrics as well. Um, so in the context of systems, if we talk about monitoring and observability, uh, they are two different things, two slightly different things. So monitoring is the raising of alarms of known bad states. So we know something goes wrong. We can raise alarms when we see that happening again. And observability is about having the ability to ask questions about the health of our system without looking inside the system. Uh, so it's how do we actually understand what's going on at any one point. Serverless itself is still growing in this space, so it's not great on, on these feedback loops just yet, but there are a few emerging tools that are worth keeping an eye on. Uh, the first is Tundra. Um, this basically wraps around your, your Lambda code and it pins together all the services that they, they call from that point. It gives you like a higher level view of the health of your system at that point. Um, when you compare this to something like CloudWatch, where you'd have to do a lot of this yourself, uh, this kind of just bootstraps you. And again, we're, we're talking about doing stuff that allows us to do something different. If we're building monitoring stuff for our servers, we're not building features for our business. Um, and to enable observability, uh, if we look at companies like Honeycomb, who take a lot of this kind of high cardinality data and allow you to ask different kinds of questions about that data at any one point. And this can even go down to a specific visitor or request correlation ID type thing as well. Uh, so there's tools starting to grow in that space. Um, and that's not to forget business metrics. So this is the reason we're building stuff uh, so that our businesses succeed. So if I define our, if I extend our developer definition uh, of part of the freeways of part of, in the kind of uh, view of the second way, the way of feedback, our definition extends to include uh, that it's a person that instruments code created for observability. And for our operations, uh, that extends to ensure that system and business metrics are visible and actionable. Um, and then finally, the way of learning. So the way of learning is about creating opportunities for learning as quickly, frequently, cheaply, and as soon as possible. Um, and I guess the big thing here is to start to embrace scientific thinking. So a lot of Damon's talk was centered around that kind of OODA loop and, and the Sun Tzu's um, art of war type stuff. The plan, do, check, act is a, another variant of that kind of OODA loop. And this basically allows us to make small bets. Like we, we expect this to happen if we make this change. What serverless does is allows us to do a lot of these changes all of the time. So we're not building something that might be in a two-week iteration. We can be doing many experiments throughout the day. 
And this means that we can do lots of these little experiments and we can continuously learn, we can continuously evolve our applications based on uh, what we're getting from our kind of fast and continuous feedback. We also need to start building resilient systems. And to do this, uh, we need to change our mindset a little bit and we need to start to redefine failure as opportunities to learn. And I think the best example of this, um, which you've all probably heard of, is uh, Netflix's Chaos Monkey. Now, if you don't know about Chaos Monkey, this was an agent that was installed um, to basically kill EC2 instances. And EC2 instances, essentially a virtual machine, which means that it's a server. And we're now working in a serverless way. There are no servers to deploy the Chaos Monkey to because there are no servers that we can shut down for things to start running. So a lesser known uh, tool that's come out of Netflix is something that's known as failure injection testing. And this is where we can use um, the headers or the metadata going into the functions or into other services to say, um, if this is present, then make this last for 10 seconds. And what's our application do in that 10 seconds? Does it bomb out? Uh, do, do we get a, a nice error message back, you know, what actually happens? We can also inject in exceptions as well. So if we know what our database exceptions are like, how does our application respond when that database happens? And we can also start to define service templates. So as we learn more about what our good serverless kind of applications look like, uh, we can bootstrap that learning process right at the start. So um, with your SLS command, you can go SLS create based on a template that has already got all of the things baked in. So if we're using Tundra, it's got a function ready with Tundra installed, for example. And it just allows us to go from that idea to production even more quickly as we learn more and more stuff. So our definition of a developer evolves again. Uh, and that now becomes someone who, it becomes a person that deploys quickly to provide new learning opportunities and designing architectures that are resilient to failure. And our operations definition extends to say, uh, that it enables the team to adopt resilient cloud architecture patterns. So if we think about the future a little bit, we spoke earlier uh, about Werner Vogel's quote, which was to reduce undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, and in my opinion, serverless is kind of that next step to take us there. We've already we've spoke about AWS commoditizing compute. Other companies are starting to do this as well. Um, and it allows us to focus on the things that actually make a difference to our business. Um, it also puts us in the ideal position to a truly adopt the ability to run it. Um, you know, we don't have to worry about operating a server. We don't have to worry about patching those servers. But what we can worry about is the applications that we're building. But I've done something very bad throughout the whole of this, which is I've defined a developer and an operations person as uh, two different groups that, you know, would be responsible for those things. And the whole point of DevOps was that that wall is broken down. So I've redefined what a team should do. Um, and that kind of looks like this. So we've got a team that is defined in the three ways of DevOps. Um, so a team builds systems, writing as little code as possible. They're responsible for the health of their services and systems as a whole. And they create and deploy, they create deploy and management tooling. Uh, the way of flow, they instrument code created for observability and ensure system and business metrics are visible. And um, the third way, they deploy quickly to provide new learning opportunities and designing architectures that are resilient to failure. Um, there are plenty of other resources out there, so I've based a lot of this on uh, Tom McCoughlin's book, uh, Serverless DevOps. Um, there are Serverless Days conferences around uh, the world now uh, who all publish their videos where you can go and learn more stuff. And the Serverless Framework is a great tool for working out how, how these things get deployed. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope you had a good evening.